Hare Krishna, everyone. Welcome back to the daily readings of Srila Prabhupada's books, where we'll, we're romping through the universe, the history of the universe, by going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, canto by canto, through the Srimad Bhagavatam. Nigamakalpa Tador Galitam Palam, which is the ripened fruit of the Vedas. And Nigama means Shruti. Agama means Smriti. So the Bhagavatam is actually, according to Jiva Goswami's Tattvasandharva, categorized as Shruti. The difference between Shruti and Smriti is that Shruti the sound is eternal. It cannot be changed, not one iota, not one letter, not one inflection. So when Bede Bias <coughs> was dissatisfied after he had edited the Vedas and compiled the Vedanta Sutra and the Srimad and the, and the Mahabharat, uh, his spiritual master, Narada Muni, shows up and Vyasadeva was, at, was, at, was able to ask Narada Muni why he was not feeling satisfied despite the fact that he had done more literary work for the benefit of human society than any other person in the history of the universe, maybe except for Lord Brahma. And then Narada Muni said, it's because in none of your works did you exclusively glorify the Supreme Absolute Truth, the Personality of Godhead. There were always other mixtures of other things. So the, the people of the Kali Yuga will take advantage of those other things and not in, in order to avoid full surrender to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, which is the only path back to the spiritual world, back to eternal uh, liberation in full knowledge and bliss. So, in response to that instruction, Vyasadeva went into trance. There's two kinds of rishis. Uh, there's one kind of rishi called Shorta Rishi, who gets the instructions of what to teach by hearing from another rishi. But there's another type of rishi, the original rishis, who can bring with, from the strength of their own meditation uh, the scriptures um, into the material world. And Vyasadeva is such a rishi. He's a literary incarnation of Krishna. So this Srimad Bhagavatam is Shruti. And not only that, it is the commentary. See, it all makes sense when you think about it deeply. It's the commentary on the Vedanta Sutra. The Vedanta Sutra is a summary of the Upanishads and the Vedas, Shruti. Nigama Kalpa Kalitor Palam. The Srimad Bhagavatam is very, very rare, and it is the summum bonum explanation of the Absolute Truth by Krishna himself. It is co-eternal with Krishna. So that's how lucky we are. That's how fortunate we are that we get to hear this scripture together. And um, Sanatana Goswami is another uh, Rishi who had that ability to call and, and lost scriptures into the universe by his meditation. He did so with the Brihad Bhagavatamrita, which is the um, appendix to Jaimini's version of the Mahabharata, and was delivered to uh, Uttara, the mother of Prikshit, just after Shukadeva Goswami delivered the Srimad Bhagavatam uh, to Pariksha and left. The Pariksha was left sitting there and some time passed between the time that Shukadeva left and the snake bird bit 
Maharaj Preachit. So during that time, Maharaj Preachit's mother, Uttara, approached him and asked him what Chukadeva Goswami had said to him. So knowing that there was not very much time, but feeling obliged by the eagerness of his mother, what to speak of the affection he felt for his mother, he agreed and he spoke to her the Briyat Bhagavatamrita, which was then spoken again by Jaimini, who was arranged by Shukadeva Goswami before he left to be sitting close enough to hear the Briyat Bhagavatamrita. So these personalities could remember everything they heard by hearing it once. We no longer have personalities like that in the world, and therefore sometimes even great scholars doubt uh, the efficacy or the veracity of these stories or these, these historical events in the Bhagavatam and in the Puranas and in the Vedas. Um, so we're very, very fortunate. We should not take this for granted. <clears throat> I've made a vow to read this and the other major books that Prabhupada translated and commented upon every day like this for the rest of my life. I thank you very much, all of you, for joining me. It's ecstatic. Hare Krishna. So let's hear from that Rishi, that great Rishi, Srila Sanatan Goswami, his glorification of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavata Mihima Stotram. And it goes like this. Sarva Shastrapti Piyusha Sarva Vedaika Sattvala Sarva Siddhanta Ratnadya Sarva Lokaika Drikprana O nectar of the ocean of all scriptures, singular fruit of all the Vedas, rich mine of the precious gems of all conclusive truths, you are the only giver of sight to all the worlds. Sarva Bhagavata Prana, Srimad Bhagavata Prabhu, Kaliman Dolita Ditya, Sri Krishna Paramartita. O light heir of all the Supreme Lord's devotees, O Master Srimad Bhagavata, <clears throat> you are the sun risen in the darkness of Kali. You are the exact image of Sri Krishna. Paramananda Padaya, Prema Varshak Sarvada Sarvasevaya, <coughs> Sri Krishnaya Namostume. I bow down to you, who are supremely blissful to read. Your every syllable pours down a flood of prema. You can always be served by everyone. You are Sri Krishna Himself. Marika Bando Matsangin, Madhuru Man Maharana, Mandistarana Madhvagya, Madhananda Namostute, my only friend, my constant companion, my spiritual master, my great wealth, my savior, my good fortune, my source of ecstasy, I bow down to you. Asadu sadhu tadayin, adhini chochitakara, anamum chavadachin mam, prengarit kapiyospura. O bestower of saintliness to the unsaintly, O exalter of the most fallen, please never leave me. Always appear in my heart and my voice with your love. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. 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 So, somebody out in cyberspace, write us a note and let us know how this new setup microphone is working. Thank you. Service announcements. Okay, we're back in the fifth canto, but we're going to end the fifth canto today, no matter what. I took a lot of time in the beginning. I didn't plan to do that. That was spontaneous. Okay, 26th chapter, beginning with the 24th, 24th verse. 
this is like this is like sobering, a sober up before you go to the rest of the <coughs> Bhagavatam. It is called a description of the hellish planets, starting with text 24. In this life, if in this life a man of the higher classes, Brahmana, Chatri, and Vaishya, is very fond of taking his pet dogs, mules, or asses into the forest to hunt and kill animals unnecessarily. He is placed after death into the hell known as Pranaroda. There the assistants of Yamaraj <clears throat> make him their target and pierce him with arrows. Purport. In the Western countries especially, aristocrats keep dogs and horses to hunt animals in the forest. Whether in the West or the East, aristocratic men in the Kali Yuga adopt the fashion of going to the forest unnecessarily and unnecessarily killing animals. Men of the higher classes, the Brahmanas, Chetras, and Vaishyas, should cultivate knowledge of Brahman, and they should also give the Shudras a chance to come to that platform. If instead they indulge in hunting, they are punished as described in this verse. Not only are they pierced with arrows by the agents of Yamaraj, but they are also put into the ocean of pus, mm. urine, and stool described in the previous verse. Text 25. <clears throat> A person <clears throat> who in this life is proud of his eminent position and who heedlessly sacrifices animals simply for material prestige, is put into the hell called Vishasana, after death. There the assistants of Yamaraj kill him after giving him unlimited pain. Purport. In Bhagavad Gita 6.41, Krishna says, Shuchinam Srimatam Gehe Yoga Brashto Vijayate. Because of his previous connection with Bhakti Yoga, a man is born into a prestigious family of brahmanas or aristocrats. Having taken such a birth, one should utilize it to perfect bhakti yoga. However, due to bad association, one often forgets that his prestigious position has been given to him by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and he misuses it by performing various kinds of so-called yagyas like Kali Puja or Durga Puja, in which poor animals are sacrificed. How such a person is punished <clears throat> is described herein. The word Dhamma Yagyeshu in this verse is significant. If one violates <clears throat> the Vedic injunctions while performing Yagya and simply makes a show of sacrifice for the purpose of killing animals, he is punishable after death. In Calcutta, <clears throat> there are many slaughterhouses where animal flesh is sold that has supposedly been offered in sacrifice before the goddess Kali. The Shastras enjoin that one can sacrifice a small goat before the goddess Kali once a month. Nor is it said that one can maintain a slaughterhouse in the name of temple worship and daily kill animals unnecessarily. Those who do so <clears throat> receive the punishments described herein. Text 26. <clears throat> if a foolish member of the twice-born classes, Brahmana, Chetri, and Vaishya, forces his wife to drink his semen out of a lusty desire to keep her under control, he is put after death into the hell known as Lala Baksha. There he is thrown into a flowing river of semen, which he is forced to drink. Purport. The practice of forcing one's wife to drink one's own semen is a black art practiced by extremely lusty persons. <clears throat> Those who practice this very abominable activity say that if a wife is forced to drink her husband's semen, she remains very faithful to him. Generally, only <coughs> low-class men engage in this black art but if a man born in a higher class does so, after death he is put into the hell known as Lala Baksha. There he is immersed in the river known as Shukranadi and forced to drink semen. 
text 27. In this world, some persons are professional plunderers who set fire to others' houses or administer poison to them. Also, members of the royalty or government officials sometimes plunder mercantile men by forcing them to pay income tax and by other methods. After death, such demons are put into the hell known as Saramenyadana. On that planet, there are 720 dogs with teeth as strong as thunderbolts. Under the, under the orders of the agents of Yamaraj, these dogs voraciously devour such sin, sinful people. Purport. In the 12th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, it is said that in this age of Kali, everyone will be extremely disturbed by three kinds of tribulations, scarcity of rain, famine, and heavy taxation by the government. Because human beings are becoming more and more sinful, there will be a scarcity of rain, and naturally no food grains will be produced. On the plea of relieving the suffering caused by the ensuing famine, the government will impose heavy taxes, especially on the wealthy mercantile community. In this verse, the members of such a government are described as dasyu, thieves. Their main activity will be to plunder the wealth of the people. Whether a highway robber or a government thief, such a man will be punished in his next life by being thrown into the hell known as Saramayadana, where he will suffer greatly from the bites of ferocious dogs. Text 28. A person who in this life bears false witness or lies while transacting business or giving charity is severely punished after death by the agents of Yamaraj. Such a sinful man is taken to the top of a mountain 800 miles high, thrown head first into the hell known as Abhijimat. This hell has no shelter and is made of strong stone resembling the waves of water. There is no water there, however, and thus it is called Avichima, waterless. Although the sinful man is repeatedly thrown from the mountain and his body broken to tiny pieces, he still does not die but continually, continuously suffers chastisement. Text 29. Any Brahmana or Brahmana's wife who drinks liquor is taken by the agent of Yamaraj to the hell known as Ayabhana. <clears throat> this hell also awaits any Chatriya Vaishya or person under a vow who in illusion drinks Somarasa. In Ayapana, the agents of Yamaraj stand on their chests and pour hot melted iron into their mouths. Purport. One should not be a Brahmana in name only and engage in all kinds of sinful activities, especially drinking liquor. Brahmanas, Chatriyas, and Vaishyas must behave according to the principles of their order. If they fall down to the levels of shudras who are accustomed to drinking liquor, they will be punished, as described herein. Text 30. A low-born and abominable person who in this life becomes falsely proud, thinking I, am, thinking I am great, and who thus fails to show proper respect to one more elevated than he by birth, austerity, education, behavior, caste, or spiritual order, <clears throat> is like a dead man, even in this lifetime, and after death he is thrown headfirst into the hell known as Chara Kardama. Chara Kardama. There he must suffer <clears throat> great tribulation at the hands of the agents of Yamaraj. Purport. One should not become falsely proud. One must be respectful toward a person more elevated than he by birth, education, behavior, caste, or spiritual order. If one does not show respect to such highly elevated persons, but indulges in false pride, he receives punishment in Chara Karnama. Text 31. There are men and women in this world who sacrifice human beings to Bhairava or Bhadrakali and then eat their victim's flesh. Those who perform such sacrifices <clears throat> are taken after death to the abode of Yamaraj, where their victims, having taken the form of rakshasas, cut them to pieces with sharp swords. 
Just as in this world, the man-eaters drink their victims' blood, dancing and singing in jubilation. Their victims now enjoy drinking the blood of the sacrificers and celebrating in the same way. Text 32. In this life, some people give shelter to animals and birds that come to them for protection in the village or forest. And after making them believe that they will be protected, such people pierce them with lances or threads and play with them like toys, giving them great pain. After death, such people are brought by the assistance of Yamaraj to the hell known as Shula Prota, where their bodies are pierced with sharp needle-like lances. <clears throat> they suffer from hunger and thirst, and sharp-beaked birds such as vultures and herons come at them from all sides to tear at their bodies. Tortured and suffering, they can then remember the sinful activities they committed in the past. Text 33. <clears throat> Those who in this life are like envious serpents, always angry and giving pain to other living entities, fall after death into the hell known as Dandashuka. My dear king, in this hell there are serpents with five or seven hoods. These serpents eat such sinful persons just like snakes eat mice. Text 34. Those who in this life can confine other living entities in dark wells, granaries, or mountain caves are put after death into the hell known as Abhata Nirodhana. There they themselves are pushed into dark wells where poisonous fumes and smoke suffocate them and they suffer very severely. Text 35. A householder who receives guests or visitors with cruel glances as if to burn them to ashes, is put into the hell called Paryavartana, where he is gazed at, gazed at by hard-eyed vultures, herons, crows, and similar birds, which suddenly swoop down and pluck out his eyes with great force. Purport. According to the Vedic etiquette, even an enemy who comes to a householder's home should be received in a gentle way, in such a gentle way that he forgets that he has come to the home of an enemy. A guest who comes to one's home should be received very politely. If he is unwanted, the householder should not stare at him with unblinking eyes. <laughs> For one who does so will be put into the hell known as Paryavartana after death. And there, and there many ferocious birds like vultures, crows, and herons will suddenly come upon him and pluck out his eyes. Text 36. One who, is, one who in this world or in this life is very proud of his wealth. One who, is, one who in this world <clears throat> or in this life is very proud of his wealth always thinks, I am so rich, who can equal me? His vision is twisted. And he, and, and, he always, and, he is always, and he is always afraid that someone will come take his wealth. Indeed, he even, he even suspects his superiors. His face and heart dry up at the thought of losing his wealth, and therefore he always looks like a wretched fiend. He is not in any way able to obtain actual happiness, but he does not, but he does not know what it is to be free from anxiety. Because of the sinful things he does to earn money, augment his wealth and protect it, he is put into the hell known as Suchi Mukha, where the officials of Yamaraj punish him by stitching thread through his entire body like weavers manufacturing cloth. <laughs> Purport. When one possesses more wealth than necessary, he certainly becomes very proud. This is the situation of men in modern civilization. According to the Vedic culture, Brahmanas do not possess anything, whereas Kshatriyas possess riches, but only for performing sacrifices and other noble activities as prescribed in the Vedic injunctions. A Vaishya also earns money honestly through agriculture, cow protection, and some trade. If a Shudra gets money, however, he will spend it lavishly without discrimination 
or simply accumulated for no purpose. Because in this age there are no qualified Brahmanas, Chakyas, or Vaishyas, almost everyone is a Shudra, Kalo, Shudra, Sambhava. Therefore, the Shudra mentality is causing great harm to modern civilization. A Shudra does not know how to use money to render transcendental loving service to the Lord. Money is also called Lakshmi, and Lakshmi is always engaged in the service of Narayana. Wherever there is money, it must be engaged in the service of Lord Narayana. Everyone should use his money to spread the great transcendental movement of Krishna consciousness. If one does not spend money for this purpose, but accumulates more than necessary, he will certainly become proud of the money he illegally possesses. The money actually belongs to Krishna, who says in Bhagavad Gita 5.29, Bhaktaram Yagyata Pasam Sarvaloka Maheshwaram. I am the true enjoyer of sacrifices and penances, and I am the owner of all the planets. Therefore, nothing belongs to anyone but Krishna. One who possesses more money than he needs should spend it for Krishna. Unless one, unless one does so, he will become puffed up because of his false possessions and therefore he will be punished in the next life, as described herein. Text 37 My dear King Prichit, in the province of Yamaraj, there are hundreds and thousands of hellish planets. The impious people I have mentioned, and also those I have not mentioned, must all enter these various planets according to the degree of their impiety. Those who are pious, however, enter other planetary systems, namely the planets of the demigods. Nevertheless, both the pious and impious are again brought to earth after re the results of their pious or impious acts are exhausted. Purport. This corresponds to the beginning of Lord Krishna's instructions in Bhagavad Gita, Tata, Dehantara, Prapti. Within this material world, one is simply meant to change from one body to another in different planetary systems. Urdvam gachchanti sattvasta. Those in the mode of goodness are elevated to the heavenly planets. Ado gachchanti tamasa. Similarly, those too engrossed in ignorance enter the hellish planetary systems. Both of them, however, are subjected to the repetition of birth and death. In Bhagavad Gita it is stated, that even one who is very pious returns to earth after his enjoyment in the higher planetary systems is over. Chine, Punye, Marchalokam, Vishanti. Therefore, going from one planet to another does not solve the problems of life. The problems of life will, will, will only be solved when, when we no longer have to accept the material body. This can be possible if one simply becomes Krishna conscious. As Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita 4 9, Janma karma chame divyam evam yo vipti tatvataha, chaktva deham punarjanma, naiti mam iti sorjana. One who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not, upon leaving the body, take his birth again in this material world, but attains my eternal abode, O Arjuna. This is the perfection of life and the real solution to life's problems. We should not be eager to go to the higher heavenly planetary systems, nor should we act in such a way that we have to go to the hellish planets. The complete purpose of this material world will be fulfilled when we resume our spiritual identities and go back home, back to Godhead. The very simple method for doing this is prescribed by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Sarva Dharman Purichaja Mame Kam Shananam Braja. One should be neither pious nor impious. One should be a devotee and surrender to the lotus feet of Krishna. This surrendering process is also very easy. Even a child can perform it. Manmana. Baba Mad Bhakto, Mad Jaji, Mam, Namas Kuru. One must always simply think of Krishna by chanting 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. One should become Krishna's devotee, worship him, and offer obeisances to him. Thus one should engage all the activities of his life in the service of Lord Krishna. Text 38. In the beginning, the second and third cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam, I have already described how one can progress on the path of liberation. In the Puranas, the vast universal existence, which is like an egg divided into 14 parts, is described. This vast form is considered the external body of the Lord, created by His energy and qualities. It is generally called the Virat Rupa. If one reads the description of this external form of the Lord with great faith, or if one hears about it or explains it to others to propagate Bhagavad Dharma or Krishna consciousness, his faith and devotion in spiritual consciousness, Krishna consciousness, will gradually increase. Although developing this consciousness is very difficult, by this process one can purify himself and gradually come to an awareness of the Supreme Absolute Truth. Purport. The Christian Consciousness Movement is pushing forward the publication of Srimad Bhagavatam, as explained especially for the understanding of the modern civilized man, <clears throat> to awaken him to his original consciousness. Without this consciousness, one melts into complete darkness. Whether one goes to the upper planetary systems or the hellish planetary systems, he simply wastes his time. Therefore, one should hear <coughs> the universal position of the Virat form of the Lord as described in Srimad Bhagavatam. That will, help save, that will help one save himself from material condition of life and gradually elevate him to the, to the path of liberation so that he can go back home, back to Godhead. Text 39. One who is interested in liberation, who accepts the path of liberation and is not attracted to the path of conditional life is called yati, or a devotee. Such a person should first control his mind by thinking of the virat rupa, the gigantic universal form of the Lord, and then gradually think of the spiritual form of Krishna, such as Ananda Vigraha. After hearing of both forms, thus one's mind is fixed in samadhi. By devotional service, one can then realize the spiritual form of the Lord, which is the destination of devotees. Thus, his life becomes successful. Purport. It is said, Mahat Sevam Dwaram Ahur Bimokte, Bhagavatam 552. If one wants to progress on the path of liberation, he should associate with Mahatmas or liberated devotees, because in such association there is a full chance for hearing, describing, <coughs> and chanting about the name, form, qualities and paraphernalia of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, all of which are described in Srimad Bhagavatam. On the path of bondage, one etern on the path of bondage, one eternally undergoes the repetition of birth and death. One who desires liberation from such bondage should join the International Society <coughs> of Krishna Consciousness and thus take advantage of the opportunity to hear Srimad Bhagavatam from devotees and also explain it to propagate Christian consciousness. There's our marching orders, folks. Prabhupada's marching orders. Text 40. My dear King, I have now described for you this planet Earth, other planetary systems, <clears throat> and their lands, varshas, rivers, and mountains. I have also described the sky, the oceans, the lower planetary systems, the directions, the hellish planetary systems, and the stars. These constitute the Virat Rupa, 
the gigantic material form of the Lord on which all living entities repose. Thus, I have explained the wonderful expanse of the external body of the Lord. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purports of the fifth canto, 26th chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam entitled, A Description of the Hellish Planets. Whoa! There is a supplementary note written by His Divine Grace Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Maharaj Prabhupada in his Gaudiya Bhasha. Its translation is follows. Learned scholars who have full knowledge of all the Vedic scriptures agree that the incarnations of the Supreme Personality of Godhead are innumerable. These incarnations are classified into two divisions called Prabhava and Vaibhava. According to the scriptures, Prabhava incarnations are also classified in two divisions, those which are called eternal and those which are not vividly described. In, the, in this fifth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, in chapters 3 through 6, there is a description of Rishabhadev, but there is not an expanded description of his spiritual activities. Therefore, he is considered to belong to the second group of Prabhava incarnations. In Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, chapter 3, verse, verse 13, it is said, Ashtame merudevyam tu na berjata urukramaha darshayan vartmadiranam sarvashrama namaskritam Lord Vishnu appeared in the eighth incarnation as the son of Maharaj Nabi, the son of Agnidra, and his wife Merudevi. He showed the path to perfection, the Paramahamsa stage of life, which is worshipped by all the followers of Varnashram Dharma. Vishabhadev is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and his body is spiritual, such as Ananda Vigraha. Mm. Therefore, one might ask how it might be possible that he passed stool and urine. The Gaudiya Vidanti Acharya Baladev Vidyabhushana has replied to this question in his book known as Siddhanta Ratna. 165 through, one, through 68. Imperfect men call attention to Rashabdev's passing stool and urine as a subject matter for the study of non devotees who do not understand the spiritual position of a transcendental body. In this fifth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, 5611, the illusioned and bewildered state of the materialists of this age is fully described. Elsewhere in 5th Canto 5519, mm -hmm. Vishabhadev stated, Idam This body of mine is inconceivable for materialists. This is also confirmed by Lord Krishna in Bhagavad Gita 911. Fools deride me when I descend in the human form. They do not know my transcendental nature as the Supreme Lord of all that be. The human form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is extremely difficult to understand, and in fact, for a common man, it is inconceivable. Therefore, Rishabhadev has directly explained that his own body belongs to the spiritual platform. This being so, Rishabhadev did not actually pass stool and urine, <clears throat> even though he superficially seemed to pass stool and urine, that was also transcendental and cannot be imitated by any common man. It is also stated in Srimad Bhagavatam that the stool and urine of Rishabhadev were full of transcendental fragrance. One may imitate Rishabhadev, but he cannot imitate him by passing stool that is fragrant. <laughs> the activities of Rishabhadev, however, do not support the claims of a certain class of men known as Arhat, who sometimes advertise that they are followers of Rishabhadev. How can they be followers of Rishabhadev <coughs> while they act against the Vedic principles? 
Shukadev Goswami has related that after hearing about the characteristics of Lord Rishabhadev, the king of Konka, Venka, and Kutaka, initiated a system of religious principles known as Arhat. These principles were not in accord with Vedic principles, and therefore they are called Pashanda Dharma. The members of the Arhat community consider Rishabhadev's activities material. However, Rishabhadev is an incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, he is on the transcendental platform and no one can compare to him. Rishabhadev personally exhibited the activities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. As stated in Srimad Bhagavatam 568, Dava Dadaha. At the conclusion of Rishabhadev's pastimes, an entire forest and the Lord's body were burned to ashes in a great forest fire. In the same way, Rishabhadev burned the people's ignorance to ashes. He exhibited the characteristics of a Paramahamsa in his instructions to his sons. The principles of the Harhat community, however, do not correspond to the teachings of Rishabhadev. Srila Baladev Bidyabhushana remarks that Rishabhadev described in the eighth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam is different from the one described in this canto. End of the fifth canto. testing out our new, what do they call this? Shot? No? We just got a thumbs down from our techie. It's not working so well? Really? What are you going to do about it? Upgrade. Huh? Upgrade. Upgrade? Oh my God. What's the problem? Oh, you, you're taking notes from the... Yeah, they said that when your volume is on maximum, they can hear it, but it's not as loud. Oh, not as loud. Yeah, when I heard it, it was like decent, but it's not as loud. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of thing that we deal with when we're recording. Depending on how loud you record it, then when you turn up the volume, it, it won't go loud enough, and it's not satisfactory. All right. Sorry, Mr. Road. That's the Road is the brand of the of the uh, microphone. <clears throat> and also, we're pretty close. Yeah. It should be fine. Does it depend on how vo much of the volume is on the uh, phone? Mm -hmm. But on the upgrade of the mic. You can control the volume of the microphone itself, so you can put it up or put it down. Really? Yeah. You, you cheaped out on us, did you? <laughs> I see. Oh, it's coming out. The truth's coming out. I, I wanted to get the more expensive one, but I always get the more expensive thing, so I was like, okay, Hannah, let's be reasonable and see. Oh, you were, you were trying to follow this, uh, you know, purport in the Bible time that says if you just buy expensive things and think that you're proud, then you'll go to hell, see? You very carefully took care of that. Okay, okay, so here we are. We have a microphone that isn't as good as it could be, but I think it's... It's audible. Audible, okay. Hare Krishna. So now we're gonna try it out even more because you're going to turn this around and see every, everyone who's, you don't even... Okay, kids, 
It's all yours. I did my thing. Finish the fifth canto. Pretty heavy stuff to hear. <laughs> Sober us up. Just the prospect of these things happening should be enough to sober anybody up. I have a question. Go ahead. Maybe this is just me being sentimental. But you're 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 not uh, doing Sorry, what you're supposed closer. to do. Okay, well maybe this is just me being sentimental. But you know, these descriptions are pretty gruesome. And as we were reading them, you know, I was thinking about how bad it must feel to should I turn it towards me? You should. Oh god. That's the way it's supposed to work. I don't want to be on the camera. So, uh, oh, I don't think that's facing me, huh? It seems like the microphone is just kind of like... Yeah. Going to the top. Does it make, does it make a difference? Can you train? Somebody can. <laughs> I don't think that's something I can do. All right. <laughs> Anyways, as we were reading it, I was thinking that Okay. <coughs> um, it must be really painful to go through those things, you know, in hellish planets. But then I was thinking about the reason why uh, souls get sent to those planets. It's because they were, you know, like like we read, like hurting other living entities, and. You know, even though that's punishment, it kind of balances it out. It doesn't take away the the suffering that you did cause to another living entity. So, like, how would you, I guess, forgive yourself? This is what you did just now, unbeknownst to you, was you <clears throat> kind of summarized a very important point in the next chapter of the Bhagavatam which describes why Priyaschitta, or purificatory ceremonies, is not enough. Hmm. Only pure devotional service can purify one of all sinful activities by taking one back to the spiritual world. As long as you're in the material world, you have to somehow or other come in contact with things that are not pure because the nature of the material world is not pure. Oh, I should turn it towards you. Apologies to our cyberspace guests. Said it, we just heard how we're supposed to offer the guests all worship as if you're God. And I, I'm afraid that I've been disrespectful to you for not for experimenting with your ears and not giving you the proper microphone. For this, we beg your forgiveness and hope that Krishna will make up for it when we upgrade or go back to the lapel mics or whatever we're going to do. <clears throat> um, where was I? You just interrupted me. So. Priya, yeah, Prayaschitta. So you made the point that it doesn't seem like that's going to clear anything. And it's true, whenever you're in the material world, not everything gets cleared. Therefore, you just go up and down. You do something good, you, you go to a better place, you use it up, you come back down. You act bad, you go down, you use it up, you come back. And that's what the material world is. It's like a combination of a Ferris wheel and a merry-go-round. <coughs> and we're stuck on it. And the only way off is to actually surrender to Krishna and perform pure devotional service, beginning with chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, and then hearing Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, and I'll let you fill in the blank, and chant the holy. No, we started out with chanting, the <coughs> and going off, explaining it to others, 
and applying it into our own characters. Because I was thinking about this the other day, that uh, you know it says yana chakshus, shastra chakshus. We're supposed to see through the eyes of the scriptures. But seeing through the eyes of the scriptures doesn't mean you just learn some information and then look out and see whether somebody is good or bad. It means you take that, you know, information and apply it into your own consciousness. And then you actually can see. And then you get light, the light of the Shastra. So we have to apply these principles into our own lives. You know, so when you hear these hellish things that people do and get these hellish, you know, we should straighten up and fly right and not do anything hellish to anyone. What is that verse? No. There's a verse that talks about how we actually can see people equally by seeing how we're like them in our happiness and distress. When you see, you know, other people's happiness and distress, and we see that it's the same that that we experience, then we won't want to do anything that puts the person into, you know, difficulty in any way, shape, or form. Atma pamina sarvatra. That's the verse. Atma pamina sarvatra. Just Krishna sent it to me. Atma pam. Sarvatra, 632. Sa samam Pashiti Yorjuna, Sukam Va, Yari Vadukam, Sayugi Paramo Mataha. He is a perfect yogi, it's okay. He is a perfect yogi who, by comparison to his own self, sees the true equality of all beings in both their happiness and their distress, O oh Arjuna. Purport. It's okay. One who, one who is, in, is Krishna conscious is a perfect yogi. He is aware of everyone's happiness and distress by dint of his own personal experience. The cause of the distress of a living entity is forgetfulness of his relationship with God. I'll repeat that. The cause of the distress of a living entity is forgetfulness of his relationship with God. And the cause of happiness is knowing Krishna to be the supreme enjoyer of all activities of the human being the proprietor of all lands and planets, and the sincerest friend of all living entities. The perfect yogi knows that the living being who is conditioned by the modes of material nature is subjected to the threefold material miseries due to forgetfulness of his relationship with Krishna. And because one in Krishna consciousness is happy, he tries to distribute the knowledge of Krishna everywhere. Since the perfect yogi tries to broadcast the importance of becoming Krishna conscious, he is the best philanthropist in the world and he is the dearest servitor of the Lord. Nacham tasman manusheshu kasjin me priya kritama Bhagavad Gita 1869. In other words, a devotee of the Lord 
always looks to the welfare of all, li of all living entities. And in this way, he is factually the friend of everyone. He is the best yogi because he does not desire perfection in yoga for his personal benefit, but tries for others also. He does not envy his fellow living entities. Here is a contrast between a pure devotee of the Lord and a yogi interested only in his personal elevation. The yogi who is withdrawn to a secluded place in order to meditate perfectly may not be as perfect as a devotee who is trying his best to turn every man toward Krishna consciousness. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Okay. Okay, we have a question from Cyberspace. From Rati Manjari. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Tonight we heard that even when an enemy comes to our home, we have to receive him in a very friendly manner so that he forgets that he is an enemy. Otherwise, we have to go to hell. We have also heard that when an aggressor comes to our home, we are allowed to kill them. Could you please elaborate on these points? Yeah, if a person comes with the purpose, you know, with a specific plan to kill you, that's different than a person who's just, he may be an enemy to be just coming to your house un unexpectedly, and he's not planning to kill you. It's not, he doesn't have a plan to do something like burn it down, or steal your wife, or do these things. This is, this is called atiti. It means uh, guests who come to your house unexpectedly or uninvited, uninvited guests. But if they're coming with the intent to kill and they show it, then you're allowed to kill them without uh, reaction. It's called self-defense. Even in most, even in most, you know, uh, legal systems in the world, you know, the, the law of self-defense applies. If someone comes to attack you and kill you, you have a right to defend yourself. Now, didn't we miss something from yesterday? Yes. But she has one more question, and then while okay. you answer it, I'll find it. <clears throat> She said, I have also heard that an un I have also heard that an unexpected guest is considered to be like Narayana, is this correct? Yes. Mean means it should mean a person who is an unexpected guest, it's not that you worship the person as God, but you you worship them as if they're God. You offer them proper respect and Treat them in such a way they will feel very comfortable. Yes, sir. So, some religions in, the, in these descriptions in the Bhagavatam says you can be punished for a long time. Are they exaggerating? When they say that the term, there seems to be a difference in the Vedic. It, it, it's not exaggeration, it's ignorance. There's nothing eternal in, in this material world. All, that's, all the activities are temporary. It's ignorance. To think that, someone would, that God would put someone in a hellish condition forever. And there's no chance. I mean, there are there are actually religious sects who think that there's only a certain number of souls that get, you know, salvation, and everyone else goes to hell forever. Like, there's one of them. I don't remember the name of. I won't go and offend anybody. <laughs> that thinks that there's 144,000 souls that are eligible to go back to Godhead, and no one else is. <laughs> So you got to you, you have to be on that list of 144,000 or else you're that that's it you got no hope. <laughs> Not a very it's like a naughty or nice list. Yeah, yeah, it's like Santa Claus. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, but, but the other thing is about that is that time is relative, you know? And what seems, like when you go around the earth in, a, in, a, in, in the, uh, say it's capsules, you, you, you go, you see the sun a lot more times quicker than uh, if you're just standing one place of the earth. So time has a different, uh, it seems different. It seems like a lot of time is going by. So the farther away you get from the sun also, the time changes. And on top of that, on the subtle plane, uh, time has a different, like when you dream, and sometimes it seems like you're going through a whole sequence of events, but if you were to actually measure in the, the brain, you know, uh, uh, synapses or something like that, yeah, then you'll, you'll, you'll see that it's not very long at all, but it seems like a long time. So one pop, 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 one time said that th these kinds of hellish things are happening on the subtle plane. They're not actually acting. They're not actually taking as long as you think they are. And then, of course, you take that to the to the ultimate conclusion, and that is that time is relative in the material world, and to Krishna, you know, the time it takes for the whole material cosmic manifestation to, to happen and develop in all the lifetimes, I mean billions of lifetimes, it's just one breath of Mahavishnu, and he's an expansion of an expansion of an expansion of Krishna, so to Krishna it's not even a blink of an eye. So we're thinking how horrible it is, but from Krishna's point of view, it's just a blink of the eye. Therefore we really have no need, no reason to uh, criticize Krishna by faulting him. He's just doing the needful to allow us to play out our material desires, that's all. Okay. Okay, this question is from Vijay Lakshmi from yesterday. Vijay Lakshmi, we'd like to give a public apologize, apology to you that we overlooked your um, question, we didn't see it. Sometimes it happens, you know, we're not God, we make mistakes. Okay, so let's hear your questions. I'm sorry, Vijay Lakshmi. Okay, she said, Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. I have a question. Why are women considered of low birth? Um, because they're not as elevated as brahmanas and kshatriyas. If you, if you analyze the verses in the ninth canto, the ninth chapter of the Gita, which says this, <clears throat> you'll see that it's in relationship to the higher uh, personalities. I'm sure there's other ways of looking at it also, but this is a fact. You know, sometimes when we take one verse out of context, and we don't take it in, in, in relationship to the verses around it, we won't be able to understand it completely. So here's the verses. Mami parte vya Ye pisu papa yoniya, striyo vaishas tata shudras, tebiyanti padam gatim. O son of Prita, those who take shelter in me, though they be of lower birth, women, vaishas, merchants, and shudras, workers, can attain the supreme destination. What? Can attain the supreme destination? Maybe we better listen to this again. Uh, o Sanaprita, those who take shelter in me, be they of lower birth, women, vaishas, merchants, and shudras, workers, can attain the supreme destination. 
what difference does it make if you seem to be higher or lower? You can, do, you can attain the supreme destination. But if you're not satisfied with that, the next verse says, Kim puna brahmana puna punya bhakta rarja shayastata anityam asukam lokam imam prapya bhajasvamam. How much more this is so of the righteous brahmanas, the devotees and saintly kings. Therefore, having come to this temporary miserable world, engage in loving service unto me. So, it's all relative in the material world. You'll always find somebody higher and you'll always find somebody lower. So we shouldn't, you know, like dwell on, I mean, Kalo Shudra Samnava. Everyone in the Kali Yuga is born Shudra. So everybody is low, lower birth. There are no Brahmanas or Chatriyas. But relative to the Brahman and Chatriya, the Vaishya, the the Shudra, the woman, the and the, there's other there's other names that aren't included in this verse that are concluded, that are considered to be lower births in Sanskrit. There are no Brahmanas and Chatriyas nowadays. You have nothing to compare yourself to. We're all born Shudras. We see ourselves, you know, I mean Prabhupada. When Prabhupada came, he was a liberated person. All of us could see with our own eyes how much el more elevated he was than us. Many devotees used to see Prabhupada, when he moved, it was like he was floating on air, you know? His movements were like so aristocratic, it was like, it would mesmerize you just to watch him take something out, and it was amazing. And he never, he was always like that. So all these things indicate that there, yes, there are higher and there are lower things, and we shouldn't think that because we're lower that Krishna is going to leave us out, as proven by this statement, te piyante param gatim. We can attain the highest, the supreme destination. Congratulations. Next. Our second question is, in text 19, what does this phrase mean? In the absence of emergency robs. In the, in the, in the absence of emergency? Yes, it means, that, it means that when you're in an emergency situation, you may do something that normally would cons be considered sinful and it won't be so taken into consideration seriously. Like if you, if you kill animals and eat them, it's considered very sinful if there's food, regular food available. But if there is nothing to eat except that, it's not considered as sinful. That doesn't mean it's not sinful, but it's relatively not as sinful. Like you were born in Eskimo, in an Eskimo, and you've got nothing to eat. There's no plants. All there is is blubber. <laughs> so you've got to eat blubber. <laughs> That's all you got. Or in the desert, sometimes all I have is, you know, whatever. Um, in relation to that, in one of the in one of the texts that we read, it said that there's a hellish planet for government officials or politicians who uh, wrongfully incarcerate someone. And I mean, in relation to that, there was a a court case of a mother who her her children were starving, and so she started to sell drugs, and she was put away life in prison. So I was just thinking that if, if, like, if people in the government actually read these books, they would know how to treat others. And also, actually, in relation to that, Rati said yesterday, what if you do these things unknowingly? So I guess 
you know, to a government official not knowing that. They just see, oh, she's selling drugs, doesn't matter the circumstances, and, they, and he would put her away. But I guess that's kind of, like, unjust in a way. But they don't know what they're doing. Am I just blabbing? It's relative. Everything is in the material world is relative. Mm-hmm. But, but whether you are, whether you know it or not, like if Prabhupada used to use the example, if you, you know, if you go to England and you drive the car on the left, I mean on the right, you see, it's been so long since I drove a car, I can't remember which is which. You drive right, here, here we drive on the right. In England we drive on the left. That's the law of the land. It's, it's wrong, it's against the law. If you do it in England, you get punished, and if you do it in America, you, you're a law-abiding citizen. You know, so it, it, everything's relative in the material world, and therefore the government laws, especially, are relative, but God's laws are not relative. You can't get away with any, anything. Therefore, all these situations are there. So we should accept them and, and learn what the laws are and then abide by them. And then we can be free. Why criticize or, you know, or speculate about this or about that? That's what these books are for. To learn what to do and what not to do but in all circumstances. And the Vedas do that. There's even... Even in the in the Manu Spriti or the Manu Samhita, there are uh, what's the word traffic laws. <laughs> There's actually a verse that says if chariot, the two chariots are on a single. There's only room for one chariot to go by. Then they meet. Then there's a law to discuss who actually has the right of way. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same. So. You know, all, all the laws are actually, in some way or another, related to, you know, God's laws. It's just when they're made up by man, they become less perfect. Therefore, in the very conclusion of this chapter, which is very nice, that says, you know, we should hear these books, and we should explain these books to others, and live by them. as much as possible. But in the material world, there's always going to be something. You can't have, you can't have the spiritual world perfectly in the same way. I mean, here we are, we have our deities, we have our lifestyle, we have our, you know, the, the regulated principles that are the root of all sin, sinful activities, and we follow them strictly, and then uh, we get relief. We get relief. The heart, Prabhupada, when he was traveling in 1975, whoops, I'm way late. In 1975, he was on his way to Chicago, and he was in an uh, airplane, and he saw the cover of a magazine, I think it was Time and Newsweek, and it said, crime, why, and what to do about it. So Prabhupada said, oh, we know what to do about it. <laughs> so as soon as he got off the plane, and they, and they, and they, they he always used to interview Prabhupada whenever he came to an airport. And they asked him, why did you come here? And he said, uh, because we know what to do about crime. And then he had, then there, it was very interesting, because then you know, a police chief came to see him, right? And then he talked about how the problem is that the heart's dirty. People do sinful things because their hearts are dirty. They're filled with sinful desires. So you have to clean the hearts. So we know how to clean the hearts. Therefore, all these young men and women who are addicted to certain things, and now you spend millions and millions of dollars, but all they say is, don't do it, and they don't do it. Save you a lot of money. And then <laughs> one of them was like, there was a building right across the street, which is really big, beautiful building. And Prabhupada said, so why don't you give us this building? 
impossible. <laughs> and it turns out that they had planned to use the building for the city hall, a new city hall for the for the that part of Chicago. Anyway, Hare Krishna. It's all there. It's up to us, each one as an individual, to learn and to apply and to see the world and see others properly. So we will not uh, incur reactions to our activities. That's called a karma, without karma, or bhakti, pure bhakti. And with that, I gotta go, because I couldn't. Uh, Maybe it was the weather. Whatever it was, I couldn't re re record this morning. So I'm going to be able to, I want to record tomorrow morning. So I'm going to stop now. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Lakshmi. Um, huh? Vijay Lakshmi, thank you very much for your questions. And uh, please keep them coming. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. The fifth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Gaur Premanandi. See you tomorrow for the sixth, beginning of the sixth canto, 6.30 Central Time, USA. Hare Krishna.